founding member and advocate. It's my pleasure to introduce you to the chair of NCTE's subcommittee on policy and advocacy, Alfredo Lujan. Alfredo teaches in Santa Fe, New Mexico at Monte de Sol Charter School. Welcome, Alfredo. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce the members of the uh, subcommittee. Uh, they are Doug Hesse from the University of Denver, Valerie Taylor, Westlake High School, Austin, Texas, Carolyn Calhoun Delahant from Yakima Valley College, Yakima, Washington, Jeff Andalora, Mesa Community College, Mesa, Arizona, and Carol Crowell, Morton Magnet School, Tucson, Arizona. As you can see, we have a good regional representation and a good uh, K-16 representation. Um, this work began uh, in Washington, D.C. in a uh, discussion uh, in February, and then the subcommittee took it to, to email, and uh, we exchanged many emails and many discussions, many conversations um, that were finally distilled uh, to one page by uh, Doug Hesse and uh, by Laura. So um, the uh, bullet points that we want to uh, address are uh, that at the federal, state, and local level, advocacy work impacting pre-K through 16 teachers and schools will promote policy that ensures equity for all students to learn reading, writing, literature, and language, to inform policy that impacts professional learning for teachers and English of English and composition, to foster and promote education, innovation in pre-K through 16 literacy instruction and learning, and to protect federal public education funding. In short, that's what we've been doing, and I pass this to Jenna. Thank you, Alfredo. Those bullet points that you shared are really uh, important because they help to guide NCT as an organization um, in the support that we provide to our members and the issues that we um, that that we work around over the course of a year. Uh, but. I want to take a moment to talk about what advocacy means to you in your own local contexts, um, wherever you may be working. Advocacy happens at all different levels. It happens within your school building, within your district, within your city, within your state, and then certainly also at the federal level. And while we have folks who gather here in Washington, D.C. each year for Advocacy Day um, to, to walk the hill and talk to their Congress people about the issues that are important to them, um, when we talk about advocacy, it, it has implications not only here in the district, but also in your own context. So advocacy is organized action in support of an idea or cause. Um, and it's, it's really focused on building relationships. Um, this is true at any level in your own building when you're advocating for um, getting a, a, your own classroom library. Um, that has to do with the people that you need to talk to to convince them that this is a good idea. The same thing is true all the way up to the federal level. Who are the people that we need to talk to to make sure that our issues get attention and, our pol and the policy changes we wanna see happen, um, happen. So it has to do with communicating with thought leaders and these can be, like I said, um, folk, your, your principal in your school or your colleagues down the hall, but it can also have to do with elected issues on issue, uh, elect, elected officials talking about issues that require policy action. It's really important to know that advocacy is not about lobbying, um, and, and that's um, particularly important because a lot of times as educators we worry that um, when we are involved in anything that has to do with advocacy we worry about it crossing the line and and being too political but in many instances um, when you're working on uh, creating change in your local context it just has to do with standing up for the things that you believe in and creating the change that's that's right so strategies that work. Advocacy is most effective when we have se several strategies that are being used at the same time. And in a moment, I'm gonna show you um, some resources that NCT has put together to support you in making this happen. Um, it has to do with connecting and communicating with and influencing policymakers um, in the context of Advocacy Day that, uh, that, that, um, that we'll be doing next week. But in a moment, we'll think a little bit about what this looks like at the local level too. So 
for Advocacy Day here, we're going to actually be doing in-person meetings on Capitol Hill. Um, and, uh, and folks are coming from all over the country to do that. And those meetings help you to establish relationships and start sharing information. Um, but in your own spaces, this can involve attending town hall meetings um, and also doing things like writing letters to the editor or visiting your, um, your state or district offices. And in many instances, it can also have to do with engaging in social media. So social media platforms, this isn't going to be a, stranger, uh, a strange concept to any of us in our current environment. So much happens in these spaces. And if you're on social media, sharing your story, spreading your word in any of these spaces um, is a good, good way to start making connections and getting the word out there. Twitter is a particularly valuable tool for doing this, um, and there, uh, the statistic right here is kind of stunning to me, but it's certainly an indicator of where we are today. 90% of Congress is on Twitter. So do you follow your congressional leaders? Do you tweet to them? Do you share information about what's happening in your own spaces with them and tell them your stories? Um, nearly every reporter that you see these days is now on Twitter. Following them can give you um, up to the minute access to the issues as they evolve. And it can also be an interesting way to open a dialogue. Hashtags are really helpful. Um, literacy uh, for, for this particular advocacy day, we'll be using the hashtag um, literacy advocacy and um, using Twitter throughout the day so that we can get the word out um, over that 24 hours, but we're hoping that it's something that you'll use in your own spaces too. Connecting with policymakers in these ways, social media is kind of a, a way that you can do it from your couches or your, your own context, but you can also connect with them um, by going and having those meetings like we talked about, um, writing letters, writing letters to them, getting uh, information out into uh, into your into your local community and they listen because you vote um, and they need to hear what you have to say so why should you connect with members and their staff you can connect with them about all kinds of issues things like funding legislation um, and and they want to help you um, they want they want to hear from their constituents hearing from you is a really important way for them to be able to advocate for these issues when they are sitting at the table and having discussions about them and one of the things that they really want to hear is your stories so um, when you are able to share a story about something that had an impact in your classroom some kind of change that you want to see and so, or some kind of issue that affects what's happening with you and your students um, your stories can help them to go and make a case in their context and um, when you talk to them, tell them your stories, tell them in concrete ways what has happened in your classroom. So many times you hear, um, you can think of many instances where politicians have gotten up and they've shared specific stories about their constituents in their context. What kinds of stories can you share with them about your work as a teacher? Um, can you invite them to visit your school? We have some really amazing stories of our members who have done this. Actually, after visits, to the Hill for Advocacy Day. Uh, they've gone and they've met with a congressional leader there and then they've invited them and said, when you're back in our district, come and visit my classroom, come and visit my school. And those in-person experiences, um, particularly if you can coordinate them um, with the press, can help to get your story out in a big way. And it also gives them an in-person touch point um, with with what's happening on the ground in their communities and that means when they go back to whether it be their state offices or in uh, in the case of the federal government when they come back to the hill they have real people um, in their minds to help drive their conversations and their and their decisions here um, also think about describing a concern and not just telling them about a problem but one of the really important things that um, helps to open the door and further conversation is when you can suggest a recommendation to alleviate that alleviate that concern so you're not just talking about this is bad that's bad but you're able to actually say and here's what would make it different help them to understand the true nature of the problem um, the nature of the difficulty that, that you're facing and what would be necessary to 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 fix it 
Um, and when you're talking about asking for funding, thinking about ways to be concrete about that, saying just saying we need more money for our schools isn't as specific as saying, you know what, if we had, if I had a library in my classroom um, where my students would be able to choose the books that they wanted to read, it would increase their motivation um, to read in the classroom. But I can't do that without funding. I can't do that without resources. So a concrete story like that um, can have implications for, for how they might go about thinking about finding funding. So three tips for in-person um, tweet or email contact. Practice and refine your story. And notice this word short here. Um, folks don't have a lot of time. They're all very busy. They have many, many different constituents. But figuring out how to make your story short and concrete um, is is going to make it sticky and something that they can remember. Um, and then thinking about how to connect your story to one of NCT's main messages or asks. Those are those, um, those points that Alfredo was referencing in the beginning, but actually um, in a moment, you'll be able to hear a lot more about um, the specific asks that we're working on this year. Um, share on-point information, a report, an upcoming event, a budget outcome. Um, do you have something, something that's not just your own personal story, but something um, specific and concrete and, um, and also sort of evidence-based that you can use to support the, the, the story that you're telling them? And then stay in touch. Um, there's lots of different ways to communicate with them after you go and visit their office, sending them a note of thanks and appreciation for their time, thinking about all the things that you do to build relationships with people in your daily life. How can you include those when you're having conversations um, with policy members um, or staff members or reporters? Um, talking to them and, and building a long-term relationship with them makes it possible for them to be able to respond to you um, in, in when they have questions or in moments of need. And I want to take just a quick moment right here um, to show you some of the resources that NCTE has available to help you with this. So on our website, um, there's a whole page that gives you all kinds of information about what we'll be doing for Advocacy Day. Um, and we hope that you can join us here in DC. But if you aren't able to join us in DC, there are plenty of resources on our site um, for all kinds of ways that you can think about engaging in advocacy on your own turf. Um, we also have all of our policy recommendations, which um, my, my colleague on the call will be going into in just a moment. Um, but all of this information is on our website too, and this is a great place for you to pull those concrete asks, those, those issues or topics that you might want to address that you tie to your story. This is a good place to look for that. Um, we have a resource on here that shows you um, ESSA implementation in the states. The, for every single state, we've got a way here that you can connect and learn about what's happening in your state and get in touch with people there so that you could be involved in the conversation um, uh, in, at, at, at the state level. And then another resource that we have that's referenced on here, but it's got an easy URL to remember, is everydayadvocacy.org. So um, this is a website that really focuses on advocacy at the local level. And because we're tying today's conversation to um, Advocacy Day, I won't go into great depth here, but I'd encourage you to explore this site because it talks about some of the same things that I just went over, but specifically talks about um, what they look like at the school level and how to become an advocate um, for, the, for the issues that matter at the local level and how to build um, a community of other um, other folks so that you're never advocating alone, um, but that you have a team of people that are working uh, to, to address the issues that matter to you. Now I'm gonna um, hand you over to Laura Colloy, who is uh, here in Washington, DC, and is helping um, NCT with its policy and advocacy work. Laura? Hi everybody. So today we're gonna talk about what's what's on the agenda, what's on the mind of Congress. And I'm sure some of these things will sound familiar as you hear some of them in the news, but we wanted to frame this in the context of how NCTE is thinking about what we're hearing and what it means uh, related to not only um, an assertive policy and advocacy agenda, but a way to also think about uh, the ways that you can be involved in through the organization in helping shape this conversation and not just be reactive. We want this to be an opportunity to be proactive. So 
So I'm not going to read all of these bullets, but just thinking through and thinking about what's common here. So as you know, the Republicans are running both the House and the Senate in the 115th Congress that started this year. It runs for two years through the end of 2018. And as we know, the Trump administration will be here with us for at least four years. And so when we think about a policy agenda, we think about what can we do in um, about an 18 month to 24 month window to influence Congress agenda. And knowing that the administration will do everything it can to influence Congress's agenda. So let's jump in here. And you look at what are the common um, items here. Budget and appropriations are at the top of the list for both for a particular reason. And that is that um, every Congress every year has a requirement under our Constitution and our law that our Congress, our U.S. House of Representatives controls the purse and they have to fund the federal government. The 2017 budget has not been complete, uh, but we are coming to Congress ready to ask for what should be done in the 2018 a recommendation because President Trump did issue what we're calling what's been called by the press and we're following suit called the skinny budget for 2018 because once they finish 2017 which will be in the next two to three weeks they will jump right into establishing the budget and the appropriations for fiscal year 2018 which starts on October 1 and so it's very important as teachers that we advocate for the things that we like or dislike about the president's budget and let Congress know what we think. Uh, on the left hand side there with Congress, I also just want to point out and it's on the right hand too, school choice is a big uh, discussion item. It's a priority of both the Trump administration with Secretary DeVos and with the Congress. We don't know exactly what the vehicle will look like for a choice initiative but we are going to be actively involved in helping shape whatever that, that proposal looks like. Uh, Congress has also said that they'd like to finish, uh, take a new look at the Higher Education Act. It's been overdue for a reauthorization since about 2013. And so it's time for Congress to re-examine the Higher Education Act. And so you'll see in our asks that we wanna look at the Higher Education Act and have a hand in that. This is where teacher preparation is uh, the priorities for teacher preparation are provided through certain titles of the Higher Education Act for universities and several other provisions that are in the Higher Education Act that directly impact NCTE and the membership of the organization. I'm not going to go through this other list, but you know, S is big in your states. Plans are up and running. Jen has given you the link to know where you could go and find out more about that and we do want to talk about ESSA in more detail. We're just not going to do that tonight, but it's a major priority in your state because, as you know, the full responsibility has shifted from the federal government to the states to implement the new law. And those state plans are now being produced and are due to the U.S. Department of Education either this spring or in the fall. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to point out is, you know, Equity and civil rights is a big priority for NCTE, and it's something that we're going to closely keep our eye on and pay attention to not only the, the administration's work that they do through the Department of Justice and the Office for Civil Rights, but also in the Congress. And so I just want you to know that it's something that's going to be closely monitored. We don't have a forward agenda on it right now because nothing has been put in the to-do column, but it's something that we're going to keep a close eye on. Okay, so now we're going to just kind of highlight um, and do a quick review of how a Congress does accomplish the budget process. On the left hand side is the just a copy of what the blueprint looks like, what's being called the skinny budget that was issued by the Trump administration. It's available online. It's only 65 pages long. That's why it's called the skinny budget. It doesn't have a lot of detail. It does include several key eliminations of programs that we care about, as so we'll talk about that in just a minute, but that's a heads up to you that the out the gate, the Trump administration has made clear some education funding is either to be eliminated or shifted, and we don't want that to occur, and so we'll be very vocal about that. On the right-hand side, it's just a rudimentary drawing of what the federal budget process looks like, and I would just remind everybody, in that top column, the president submits the budget to Congress, 
President Obama submitted his budget last February, and we're still in the second bucket there trying to finish the final pieces of last year's budget. So that's why I'm saying that has to be done in the next few weeks. And then we'll go through what should be more we'll closely follow a regular process for 2018. Uh, this is just a quick you know, reminder of how the uh, basics one, two, three of what lawmaking looks like. And it's a little bit messier than this, but this is the, if you remember taking civics in eighth grade or in junior high or middle school, this is what we all learn about is that both the House and the Senate have to have something similar uh, proposed. They each pass a bill through committee. It goes through their respective committees. And we work closely at NCTE with the committees that work on education issues in both the House and the Senate. Uh, and oh, can we go back to that, Jenna? Thank you. Uh, and then the bills go through committee. They if they are well supported and have the support of the leadership, they can go to the respective House and Senate floors. The bill goes into conference committee for ironing out the differences between the House and the Senate, and then it goes back to each respective, the Senate or the House, for another vote. And then if everything goes well, it can go to the President for signing. And so that's basically what the process looks like. Uh, we know there's a lot that happens in between there, and that's where NCTE wants to be very involved. For instance, in the Higher Education Act reauthorization, it's in the very top category there where they're gel gelling the ideas in the committee, and we want to have a hand in what both the Senate and the House propose to the Higher Education Act before it goes through a markup in committee. Okay, now let's jump into what we're actually asking this Congress to do. And these uh, asks were developed by the Subcommittee on Policy and Advocacy of NCTE with um, meetings that were conducted with key Hill staff and members of Congress in February and trying to get a handle on what the priorities are and then also examining the skinny budget and, you know, understanding at least what we know right now. And we may need to add things as things progress and change, but this is what we know we need to be doing at this particular time. It's very important for us to have a voice and a say uh, in these decisions that are being made. So in appropriations, we have these three major asks. And if you go to the website, there's actually one more on higher education, but we wanted to just focus tonight on these three. Public education funding is under attack. And so it's very important for those of you who work in public education, most of you do, that you understand that the funding that comes to states through formula funding for Title I, which is you know, for disadvantaged uh, children uh, and for the schools that have those kids, Title II, which is the professional development funding that's funded under ESSA, is also under attack. And then the literacy program that NCT has a long-standing track record of supporting that was placed into ESSA with bipartisan support has also been recommended for elimination. So while Title I, I want to make clear, is not being recommended for elimination, for this year it's being flat funded, which is unfortunate. Title II, there's been a recommendation that it would be eliminated, and then the LEARN Act has been recommended to eliminated. These are all recommendations in the president's budget. Now we know Congress won't do everything the president asks, but in order for Congress to have the backing that they need to say no to the president, they need to hear from us to do that. They need to hear from you to do that. And so it's important that you understand and can just speak to, write a letter, email, come with us on the Hill, whatever you can do to support and reinforce these asks related to K-12 education. Oh, let me just say one thing to um, any of these recommendations that we're making. Jenna gave you a very good recommendation I wanted to reinforce. Members of Congress will be so responsive if you can say to them, we really need Title II funding because it really supports the professional learning program in my school, in my district. I benefited, I teach other teachers who benefit, whatever the recommendation is, they love to hear exactly and you know, concrete reasons why that funding is so important. In higher education, the one specific appropriations ask that we have is under Title IV in the Higher Education Opportunity Act, 
In the SCUNY budget, uh, President Trump has recommended that TRIO and Gear Up be eliminated or reduced and that Pell Grant money be shifted away from Pell into other program areas. And many of our NCTE members understand and want these programs, these, act, these programs that support access for low-income students into college to be supported by Congress. And so it's important that we let Congress know the funding that's been provided the TRIO and Gear Up and Pell should not be eliminated, reduced, or shifted elsewhere. Laura, we just had a quick question um, uh, from uh, an audience member. She was asking, what does flat funded mean in the Title I? Oh, thank you for asking that. Flat funded means from the current fiscal year that there was an amount, and I'm sorry, I don't have it right here in front of you, but whatever the amount is from the current fiscal that would be carried over into the next year, which means there's no increase in funding whatsoever. So let's talk about authorizing. And remember, I probably didn't say this earlier, but there's a distinct difference between appropriations, which has to be done every year, and authorizing, which is the big basic federal laws that cover education that are supposed to be examined by Congress about every five years. And so the law that we're gonna focus on this year, because Congress has indicated Given that ESSA, which was the reauthorization of the Elementary Secondary Education Act, is now complete, that they can now move to the next one that's in line, which is the Higher Education Act. And so currently the Higher Education Act is called the Higher Education Opportunity Act, but in 1965 it was placed into law as the Higher Education Act, and so we just call it the Higher Ed Act for short. Um, but this is the bill the law that Congress is re-examining, both the House and the Senate are drafting new versions and updating this law. And so this is a place where NCTE wants to have a, make a footprint on updating the law. And so the committee has set two major priorities for the reauthorization. What will come next is, oh, I'm sorry, go back. We'll keep working uh, to make these two priorities a reality through legislative language. So the first one is support policy that prepares teachers across the curriculum to advance reading and writing and prepare teachers in all disciplines to work with English learners and non-standard or global English speakers. This is a wonderful priority. It's a great opportunity and we have the access to the staff and the members of Congress who will want us to help them know how to do this. We will need to dig in and, and write some specific language to make this happen, but this is the priority. And so everything that we would examine, propose, and review will need to meet this, this priority for us to want to support it. And then, of course, there's been a strong push, and as you know in the membership, this has strong support to support policies that create stronger vertical connections between high school and college reading, writing, and literacy programs. And this is so that graduates can be prepared for careers in all fields, including STEM and business, and that literacy is key to being able to be successful, and that these programs between high school and college need to be better aligned. And so we'll be working on that as well. And so we want you to ask members of Congress and other leader, uh, policymakers um, and explain to them why this is so important. As you know, this isn't new that public education uh, funding has been under attack and that public education has been under attack. There have been different points in time when historically when uh, other administrations have come to Washington DC or even locally, you know, as your communities have discussed whether to add charters as a, as a choice initiative, whether to add education savings accounts, tax credits, or vouchers to state systems, because over 20 states have these some kind of choice initiative. So the debate isn't new. How to pay for it isn't new. But NCTE decided it was time to really examine and be very clear about what the organization's priority is related to public education and public education funding. And so the organization has agreed that and with the committee's leadership, that we are going to be a loud, vocal, thought leader and voice with the other school groups and organizations that want to support public education and want to reinforce that public education funding should not be used for school choice initiatives, that we can't take these uh, precious resources away from public schools and shift them elsewhere to private schools, to religious schools, to homeschooling or whatever. 
that public education must be supported and reinforced. And so I'm not going to read these bullets, but, and like I said, we don't know exactly how the school choice initiative at the federal level will come forward, but what we want to make clear is we don't want our limited public education dollars to be the way to pay for it. And so we're going to work on that very actively, and we hope that you'll work with us on that. And finally, just to motivate everybody to go out and do something, um, every member and advocate, as Emily said, we hope that you'll leave this evening or when you're listening to this as you prepare to go into a visit, to write an email, to tweet, or to, you know, engage in this conversation that you'll do one thing, you know, plan that visit, start following some of your reporters locally and push in some information to them from the great work that you're doing. You, um, everybody's got such thoughtful journals and blogs and reports and information that can be so helpful as reporters are writing stories and members of Congress are considering policies. Your local leaders need to know. Your local school board needs to know. So we hope that you'll leave tonight, um, today, and plan to do one thing uh, related to advocacy, to advocate for any of the positions we've, we've shared today or those that are closely connected that you know will support and reinforce the agenda. Thank you, Laura, and everyone for joining us this evening. We do welcome additional conversations with you uh, via email to any of us um, on this uh, webinar. As Laura said, now is the time to advocate now, and every member is indeed an advocate. So while it's so long for this webinar, it's until we engage again, whether that's by email or in person. Your voice is truly what makes a difference because you are serving uh, students every single day and know best, know what's best, excuse me, for education. Thank you again from all of us, and we look forward to working with you um, in the near future. Good night. <laughs>